But what a pleasure. How great it is to be here. I uh, really appreciate the invitation. Uh, and, and being in the Free Times Cafe brings back great memories. In fact, in this corner, uh, Free Time, I think it was this corner, free, or maybe it's right here where I'm standing right now. Uh, back in 1983, I happened to uh, be uh, attending a, a readings here. And I sat at a table with Gwendolyn McEwen, Dorothy Livesey, and Elizabeth Fox, and and uh, and we all had a beer sitting in front of us, and and uh, so it was one of my uh, uh, just great memories of going out to the readings at that period when I was living in Toronto, uh, way back then, uh, 34 years ago. But anyway, uh, in the free times was the it was a great place then, it's a great place today. Great place tonight! Yeah. Uh, hey. Austin C. Clarks, when he was free and young and he used to wear silks, a short story that he published in 1971. And so that's the title of my poem and uh, the subtitle is Subtext. So this is the, my imagined subtext to Austin Chesterfield Clark's great story. And I'm uh, very sorry that he has passed on uh, to his uh, reward after 82 years and great years of writing. Navigating the archipelago of rainbow lips and neon lustrous nylons, plus islands of pepper in the Caesar, the reefs of lime in the Cuba Libra, and dodging the chiseled Aztec bar relief of cruelty Evan Sheba's profile, their chatter always as indecipherable as papal Latin, Swished suave eye into the pilot tavern, me garbed as for Tiger's Coconut Grove at Kensington Market, but now stepping off Bloor into Yorkville, Fifth Avenue gone Greenwich Village, under an August moon as limony as that unmoored by the untaught Rousseau, but projecting wishes as dreamy as the philosophy of the other Rousseau, came this blacking scribe to escape the chop chop guillotines of cops' mouths, the manacles of crickets eye of critics' eyeglasses, the dismembering megaphones of Dixieland kits jazz. The ingrained dirt and wonder, white bread, ad jingle crams, T.O. airs, and the unspoiled fists of Black Panther imports, kept tight leashed by Brampton Billy Spuds, and so boogie down I to chant Rastafarian, ah, Frumosa, Frumosa, ah, beautiful, beautiful, because the Pilot Tavern is Toronto's Parthenon, at least for tonight, and the silk patina of my Bombay Sapphire Gin Martini with three olives hid from inhibition the subversive geometry of sable breasts or ladies' angular, flexible legs, one black woman's stretched out leg lecturous against mine under a table size to fit only two glasses so that the poetry of my Negroni cocktail outshouted and outvoted all that short pants childish Anglican theology, all that incense that theories the aroma of young corpses or of kitties cord and or buggered in the warrens of his and her majesty's churches. Aye, Clark, the slinky lady lady uh, exhaled and her breath came as fresh in my direction as one of Bridgetown's April sea breezes, though she had the green apple sour look of a just, but of a just bitten into virgin, her innocence gone cracked but juicy and juicy but tart, as if her Romeo were gnawing her like a badly starved stallion, despite the mahogany summer, the sable sultry evening, the bluish liquor and the single divorcee's glass, the blush of orange lipstick at the lip, the skin-tight sheen of her gilt-flecked nylons making gold schlag or mint chocolates of her legs. I also espied her song of solemn and elegance, her coy mischievous peeping at her rivals, whether masculine or feminine, her gleaming statue demeanor which meant that a tear would freeze if ever one tried to cross her face. Her tart, soldierly temperament that declared her no longer married, no longer burdened, but free, and newly single, but experienced in bed, no longer naive at what comes naturally, and at ease with herself, her conscience, her conscious science, when at pleasure, and at ease with her long-gone history, the former frenzy of adultery, given her acid bath baptism and the healing balm of feminism, just a coming on strong now and affording gotten with it women even wise, the dirty privilege of fucking come who may, so that coitus issues human ecstasy, just a so trusty it's rusty strategy to ditch a dude before he ditches you or ditches your heart, leaving in femme to suffer squalid senescent solitude of come dawn abandonment. 
I ye Clark, the bell damned divorcee purred with pertinent glances her rich dead Nazi air exhaling Goldschlager, Jägermeister, and peppermint schnapps in equal thirds, hailing, uplifting her above the pilot tavern siswar set of squalid snail textured slimy winks of lounge bunnies and bar stool tons, all squirrely, unrepentantly lewd, their scandalous impulses and principles of Shakespearean bastardy, as if Romeo were Caliban and Juliet was Lady Macbeth, but I knew I should shouldn't mistake this ex-wife's sexual laxity as caprice, for lovemaking serendipity isn't capriciousness, just as serendip isn't capri. The two islands sit in different seas. My Negroni was a fickle refuge or a glossy weakness while I suffered, while I offered the Onyx Madam cigarette smoke palette compliments that only metastatized her malignant ego, so that it became my foggy hope that she name her fave pagan as Priapus and become my handy Venus, or agree that romance is garbage topped off with the ice cream that's sex, and, and that it's better to go straight to the ice cream, rather than amble through the trashy preamble for the mechanics of intercourse, seldom involved gregariously engineered commerce, even if authentically unprincipled and ideologically loose, but are rather spasmodic joints and plumbing that render he and she supernatural divine, despite the underlying undying sleaze. And wasn't this sweet bitch worth every sweet cent? I offered, I ordered us both, both tequila and champagne to knock out two knockout Shaquillas to benefit the ex-wife Panochita with her Las Vegas strip Fredericks of Hollywood bust, the Playboy-inspired play text that presented two dark velvet breasts as two maracas already shaking, stirring, airy manners were kaput. Will she or won't she? That's what mattered. The diesel promise of Jack diving into the box and uncramped capacious vice. The woman's vampire grin as she slurps the vicarious milk I pump while I mumble plumped up, plumped down words at her hager chugging of my spit polished speaker, and then we spur on pomp and circumstance in an earthy bed, romping, raunchy, rambunctious until thrills roll up and down her spine and we enjoy clustered eruptions. She rose. Nature called. I schemed a booty call. I watched her sumptuous gluteus maximus whine, and she went. Her model skin tone shimmering a coffee splendor. Will we be practiced playmates, I wonder? The waiter levitates armfuls of bottles, ditches them at each table, one by one by one, like a deconstructive Noah. A two-ton Torontonian, part Cabbage Town and part Rosedale, now annexed by U of T classes, and a cockroach and rat tail apartment doing nightclub waiting as his part-time prison vacation. The lad finally reached me whose tongue was gutting the sediment sentimental at the base of my glassy basic instinct still. My hand spoke the rustling Moloch lingo of moolah to bring on more booze, more psychological gasoline, so that the singular divor divorcee splits James Brown like her inner thighs to show a pink flourish, the dawn of sunny debauchery, after offering her short-lived lingerie. The feministized divorcee returned, my lungs changed chords, preening amid smoke and smoky robust in his meddling wild law cries. This independent woman surveyed for me the aliotic wasteland that's divorced, while I spilled down precious fluids and unbroken ripples, and the lady sucked sexily at her drinks, secreting now and then the gaseous piss of her pregnant silence. I eyed the other patrons, men, jolly, plush, gaudy, cigar-puffing, and women whose bodies, turn and whose bodies turn garbage cans, and then ogled my serendipitous siren, once another man's wife, just as she announced, I've gone through a lot of men, goats and togas, and now I go through a lot of pills. Loneliness is unnerving, toxic, but most motherfuckers have elementary personalities, evil. I've never thought that women's liberation means descending into muck, but sex seems to require such prosthetic stimuli and lubricants, including lurid alcohols, and that sex can be bravura with animalistic authenticity, so my top mouth is open but stuffed with some lower down serious bastard gets me going with primal fuckery. Pardon my freedom, I know. It's so unladylike, and I feel like an anxious mirror in this horse opera nightmare of rear end coupling, so I begin to gag on implicit misogyny while feeling a hearty musophobia and start acting the couch surfing adulteress, a no mind, no man, no one man slut, but next I'm curiously farting or inhospitably, incontinently grunting until strange dark smells overwhelm. Sex has an aesthetic of annihilation, and what is more hateful than hate? Only self-pity. I studied my interlocutor. I saw that her cosmetic was her speech or her silver tongue and her own face. Her bitchy intelligence almost held hostage my lust for her glimmering thighs. Her dress golden looked sunlight. Her nipples looked peaked, thrusting straight through her bra, but her mouth, her speech was a broken open wound. To lay up in bed with her, thought I, would be to enter a snarling then snoring trap. 
I ride bareback bucking in her cathedral, but she preferred doing it while she sports long white gloves, playing a vogue debutante. Yes, she's in bourgeoise with tits that quiver, but check the pupils of her eyes. Are they as unscrupulous as they are unmatched? Blinding psychedelic psychedelia had detoured me to the pilot tavern in this table. I had no economic deterrent. I'd fruit many capable and talented Caucasian intellectuals, scintillating but not at sin, if such was sex, and flaunting that lavish schadenfreude at the troubles of Nixon, and then their Freudian troubles in bed. They kicked over marriage and motherhood only to mount pedestals of indecision. I now regarded Madame with unbelievably bloodshot eyes that flickered over her peekaboo breasts, her aviary bright avoir du poids, while inhaling her intractable perfume. So I craved to be her silk savior to pry her saggy or structural snatch until she was haggard. She filled my eyeballs dimensions. I hoped she'd be plum delighted by my plum tinted and plum textured agent, for she was just as stiffening of my member as is well, so I've heard strangulation I now sprung for unbroken drinking the dim honey of feral ales plus expensive quantities of honey honest sherry to pray for the sight of her cantering rump after sharing French kisses as if Siamese twins and doubling up in a lascivious double bid so that I, a bull-like man, could ram that lamb-tight dame and spring forth my constipated seed and a lover very, very pretty, but pretty much coming apart at the seams due to the diddling of bad men, such as that stifling husband, that trifling spouse, as despicable and as disgusting as shit that leeches to his shoe. Now came back my sabbatical down the U.S. South, a black tango of nooses and mix, a space of Hubble dwellers dispossessed of dreams of so-called Negroes sustained by red clay and collard green cheapness among ravages of weeds, beetles, plows gone to dust and rust in a landscape of vultures, human chewed soil, haphazard imprisonment or chain gang employment, honky-tonk fascists, a conspiracy of piggy cops and pork chop fatted politicos, a site where my hapless blackheads, where any hapless blackhead to squat in a cell and for returning to unyielding poverty, all their ambition ruptured or their balls literally cut off or their brains shot out or heads bashed in. But here was this lush, luscious chocolate Dixie bone bone up in T.O. from the South who was no milky insipid Desdemona, no weather-beaten blue rinse bourgeoise, even if she was a brow-beaten ex-mate, but right there under the overhead blackness of the velvet ceiling designed for black light and present like a Christmas present with all of her buxom bill, whose foundation seemed pharmaceutical so that now I can see the bestial presumption to fuck on all fours to treat the Afro-American, the newfangled slang, to such stout engineering. Her spinal cord would sing like a violin and she'd get high in my sap, my milky silken germs, perhaps while still being garbed in her golden upper crust costume with alcohol gurgling back blackly in our bellies. Now to leap Nude upon nudity in infinite sinfulness after love lifetime of numerous lies, plentiful valentines, not because I long for crime, but because I'm committed to my liberty as, mercilessly, as mercilessly as is a merchant, to dissect the spectrum of black, brown, beige, blanche bells, to cast even brilliant blue stockings in wholesalely dirty, homemade blue movies. Here's the fluorescent, if not italicized, subtext of when he was free and young and he used to wear silks. A story as cunning as pessimism, if fundamentally realistic regarding politics and guest at black male attitudes vis-a-vis -vis masculinity and heterosexuality. If narration is always confession, know that evil is the erection of nature over reason. That uh, encouragement, and and uh, so for now for something completely different, uh, and this is uh, uh, well, <laughs> maybe it's not completely different. Uh, so from gold, my fourth coloring book, uh, just out this past April from uh, Guernica. Sorry, not Guernica, not yet. Gasparo. Gaspro, there is a book coming from Guernica later this year, uh, God willing. Uh, but anyway, golden moments. Gold is Il Vino dei Poeti on a Lutanza flight bridging Longfellow and Dante. Gold is the gleaming chaos of Venetian canals emerald as Portuguese wine. Gold is gusts of grief from lousy lungs wallowing in sallow phlegm. Gold is bottomless depravity and overthrown virginity. 
Gold is perfume hissing from a white lady, black hair kissing her thighs. Gold is tireless light, ageless light, endlessly embryonic light, ignited darkness as in the Bahamas. Gold is love, spread eagled L and V. And O, so violated it looks like E. Gold is the red army sacking Berlin and black shirts ransacking Rome. Gold is blue collar rapists and white collar pedophiles. Gold is using your face, your ass to flush out coffee and cream. Gold is delirious ebony, whalebone, corseted, and merchant's ivory. Gold is red wine bleeding through the skin of a tablecloth. Gold is the merchant of Venice, Timon of Athens, and the merry wives of Windsor, a swingers club. Gold is a dove, its throat cut, gory, moonlight spewing free. Gold is burnt sienna, umber, periwinkle, cerulean, charcoal. Gold is a whore by nature and a prostitute by profession. Gold is Malcolm X, Iceberg, Slim, Miles Davis, and Dorothy Proctor Mills. Gold is never having to say I'm sorry. Gold is Goldfinger, diamonds are forever, and the man with the golden gun. Gold is neutrally lurid, brutally metaphysical. Gold is the writer center of Madeira rebranded as the school of criminology. Gold is an unyielding, unrehearsed, unexpected truth. Gold is Bellini, Bianco, Blanc, Apple, Vermouth, sold by Loblaws and Gatineau all. Gold is Marx and Lenin, Lenin and McCartney, Mao and Dirty Linen. Gold is Tim Tam Tum, that coffee dark wine that sticks like caramel. Gold is the sugar maple burns of Nova Scotian chainsaw poets. Gold is Andorra, Monte Carlo, Malta, Rhodos, Barbados, and rainbows between. Gold is Maurice, Calvados, Saxe, Calvados, Violet, Calvados, Le Duc, that triangle. Gold is a black Lolita nymphette whose palimpsest to white Layla Alderessa. Gold is extinguished purple and distinguished silver and anguished gray. Gold is the sun lost in the shade of the moon. Gold is directions home and traverse. Illicit sonnets and extra illicit sonnets. Fool's gold and sulfur, sunlight and the philosopher's stone. Gold is gold, the light before your eyes. And I should uh, 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 finish up with uh, uh, advice to uh, uh, governments and, and so on. And this was actually in response to the unfortunately um, late uh, 64th mayor of Toronto, uh, uh, who uh, just passed away earlier uh, this year, and who made a lot of headlines back in 2013-2014. I was a uh, poet laureate at the at the time of the uh, late Mr. Ford, and people asked me, many folks asked me for uh, to write a poem uh, recognizing the news stories that he was generating. Uh, to put it mildly, and, and uh, because I didn't want to get into a conflict of interest uh, and so on, I wanted to protect the position for future Poets Laureate. Uh, I, I could not, I could not uh, uh, write anything uh, at the time, uh, but I would say to those who asked for a Rob Ford poem, if you really want something, just pick up Humpty Dumpty, and that should do the trick. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, to really fulfill this, this yearning that people had to have some kind of response, poetic response to the sagas at City Hall back in that, in that year, 2013-2014, I wrote this poem, Principles of Good Governance, and it's uh, in memory of two eminent Torontonians, Dr. Sheila Basher, 1956-2008, uh, uh, and Mr. Charles Roach, LLB, 1933-2012. Principles of good governance, educate the electorate. Illiteracy rots democracy. Equality, fine schools, fine teachers in every district. The citadel of reason, the library. Quote scripture, cite history, recite poetry. Do not plague the people by shouting drivel. Do not demonize opponents. Do not mislead or confuse, produce facts. Honesty is state treasure. A governor's speech must be as clear as water. Clarity is a branch of charity. To be decisive, first be incisive. Judgment must be as cool as steel, as sharp as steel. To convince is better than to conquer. Complaint is revelation. News perpetually startles, yet its truths are ancient to the perceptive. Do not pander, also do not puff up superiors. Flattery is bribery, it is slush. Excuses enshrine cowardice. 
Remember, great thought leaps upward to try to discern divinity. Political success, a silver tongue and a heart of gold. Elected, serve the people. Sobriety, punctiliousness, generosity, and intelligence, these qualities demand allegiance. Ethics is a scythe, separating the correct from the corrupt. Even the bad governor envies good policies. The heedless governor is soon headless. Good laws set themselves good examples. Extremism only serves thermometers. Excess disguises dysfunction. Egoism is insufficiency. Envy dreams up conspiracies. Error in one law, corrected in the next. The lawsuit never fits unless it's a straitjacket. First, comprehend justice, <laughs> then apprehend criminals. Dust dwells and swells when the broom is stayed. Police secrecy equals sedition. Citizens must be governors lest they be oppressed. Plant vineyards, not prisons. Plant vineyards, cart home the city wine. The treasury is for the citizens' convenience. Sacrosanct is renminbi. Capital labor pools. Greatness, public works, public art. Spend, do not let potholes become sinkholes. Beauty demands maintenance. When in debt, build. When in doubt, build. Paper wealth is air, build. Diversity rouses beauty, light does not discriminate. Nurture, infrastructure, agriculture, manufacture, architecture, arts, and culture to richly prosper. Create, profit, save, invest. Create, profit, save, invest. To secure heaven, help the lowly. Benevolence staves off violence. Charity engineers miracles. Plutocracy vomits black bread, black flags, and black batons. Arms dig deficits. Spending should be like planting, never like eating. Taxation should be transfusion, not vampirism. Squander revenue, spark revolts. Paltry is that government careless of poetry. Youth creates, age preserves. Revere children, respect elders. Sun is bomb, rain is ointment. Light allows no doubt. Good style wins popularity. Good deeds inspire devotion. Be a Caesar to allies and a sphinx to adversaries. Beauty escapes chastisement. Good wine precedes good poetry. Good wine succeeds good poetry. Uh, uh, anybody who wants a coffee, only $20. Only, only $20. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so, so much.